cloud. Okay, very good. Okay, welcome to lecture 12 of quantum field theory. No, oh, yes, 12. No, 13, 13. Last week was 12. We're going to continue our trek up the mountain of scattering amplitudes. And we have already intuitively gotten a sense of how powerful uh, this spinner helicity formalism is because we have started to see some cancellations. We've started to see some uh, of these identities and relationships between the ways we've defined our scattering amplitudes in this space. However, we've had to give up some stuff, right? Namely, the first condition is we've had to work, work with complex momenta, right? Which is not necessarily physical. Uh, that's, that's a problem. The second problem we have is we, we're working with only massless particles, which I mean, Anytime you have massless particles, you can always assume you're working in some high energy limit, right? Where everything is massless. Uh, but, but yeah, so we've had to give away a little bit, but so, you know, if you want some new mathematical formalism, sometimes you have to give away a little bit, right? You can't, if you can't, most of the time, you can't expect to retain everything that's a part of your old formalism. Okay, so the first goal is to apply this now to QED. Right, that would be the natural thing. And really we're only missing one object to do this procedure in QED, and that is the polarization vector. Right. So let's just write them down. So epsilon mu minus of PQ, right? So now I'm gonna need two polarization vectors. This one equals bracket P gamma mu box Q over root two, I can't remember if it's box or bracket underneath. Kyle, you got us, you need to spotlight the video. Oh, sorry. See, I told you I'd be a little slow today. There we go, great. Okay, very good. Yeah, uh, so this one is box PQ. And of course I need a, a positive polarization vector. Equals P gamma mu root two I don't know my dog's going crazy I don't know if you can hear the barking but okay okay so let's just say Q is not equal to P right that means that I need to choose some arbitrary reference spinner. So if I want to use any of these, I need to choose some arbitrary reference spinner, right? That's the way we do QED. Uh, we kind of have to choose what we want to work with. And remember, all of these satisfy the massless while equation, which is just P mu epsilon mu of P and Q equals zero. That's like our basic uh, while equation. I should put plus minus here because we have two different polarization vectors. Okay, uh, I'm going to write this in kind of nicer notation. So we say that epsilon slash of P and Q, no, no, the slash notation really stuck after <laughs> Feynman. Uh, uh, so yeah, we should, we should, we should uh, stick with that. So we have root two PQ. Okay, I can never get these combinations right. P, Q, plus P, Q. Or actually, sorry, this should probably be Q, Q. There we go. And similarly, I can just define epsilon slash plus basically the same thing, but just, it's just gonna be the same thing, but all the angles are gonna take boxes and all the boxes are gonna take angles. So this becomes P, Q plus Q. Oh God, you know, that's a bracket, I'll just write it. There we go. Okay, 
So that's our like first step. We have to define polarization vectors. All of these impose and are manifestly gauge invariant, right? So how can I write that down now? I can say that epsilon mu plus minus of p can go to some epsilon mu plus minus of p plus some cp mu plus some translation in the momenta. Right? And so what we're saying is that these polarization vectors do not change the on-shell amplitude. They better not, okay? Or, or, or transformations on them do not change the on-shell amplitudes. In other words, the, the better way to really write this is to say that the Ward identity holds. So that's just P mu, A mu equals zero, where A is the amplitude, right? Not a gauge field. Remember, this is just our Ward identity. We wrote this as K mu, M mu. It's the same thing. I'm just writing differently. Okay. So, so, so this is the schematic now of these polarization vectors. And of course, they're going to come up in our calculations that we know because, right, every photon has a polarization. Any vector particle needs one of these. We need to specify this. We haven't worked with these yet. Okay, can I erase the board? In, in, in many ways, uh, learning spinner helicity is really like learning a new language. And so what I would do is now that I've, I've given you the definition of polarization vectors in this formalism, go to your quantum field theory notes or go to your textbook and see the construction of the polarization vector in normal field theory, right? Without all of this stuff attached to it and see how they compare, that's important. You don't want to like have this written down and it's some random angle bracket thing, although we've defined it in terms of sigma matrices, right? So, you know, so that's the thing. Uh, you don't want it to be like that. Okay, so we can trek on. So let's write down the Lagrangian for QED. And basically, in essence, all we had to do is add this extra object uh, for QED, the polarization vector. So what is the Lagrangian for QED? That just minus one fourth, F mu nu, F mu nu, F mu nu is the field strength tensor. And I'm gonna gauge fix this right off the bat. So this is I psi A mu. So A mu is just my gauge field. And of course, I'm gonna have a covariant derivative. So that's D mu minus I D A mu, right? And st in that derivative spot, psi. So this is our gauge fixed QED Lagrangian, right? And by now you should know this is gauge fixed because it has a covariant derivative, right? That will, that will gauge fix it. So this is manifestly locally gauge invariant. So let's start with a very basic example. So let's have the interaction of a massless fermion with a photon. So the amplitude is just going to look like A3, three, three particles of some F of helicity H1, F bar of helicity H2 for the antiparticle gamma, right? Because gamma does not have any helicity. Or actually, wait, helicity it will have, plus one or minus one, right? Sorry about that. That says H3, H3 right above the gamma, yeah. Okay, so let's have F be an electron and let's have F bar be a positron. Okay, and we know our interaction particle is just a photon. Okay, and let's assign the helicities as, helicities as follow. Let's make H1 minus a half for the electron, H2 plus one half for the positron and H3 minus one for the photon. Okay, so that's my, you, you have to assign a helicity structure, right? And we know already from just intuitively that there's something we have to, we have to think about whether the particles have opposite helicity or the same helicity, right? Because we don't want the amplitudes to vanish. So that's important. Okay, so uh, this one shouldn't vanish. So then we have I A3, uh, F minus, F bar plus gamma minus, right? Just filling in my helicities. Okay, 
and we get u bar minus of p1. So that's the first spinner for the first particle. I e gamma mu v for the antiparticle, and it's going to get a plus because it has a positive helicity, v plus of p2, right? Epsilon mu minus p2. Good. What particles did you say this process was? Uh, two mass, massless fermions and one photon. Okay. Okay. No propagator. It would look something like, you want me to draw the Feynman diagram? Okay, it would look something like this. Okay, that's what I'm drawing. There's one vert interaction vertex. That's where this IE gamma mu comes from. One polarization vector for the photon, two spinners for my particles. Very, very simple, very basic amplitude. Nothing really remotely crazy. Okay, now I'm gonna write this in spinner helicity, okay? Because this is not in spinner helicity yet. And spinner helicity, I get minus IE one, gamma mu two. Okay, so I get these, uh, now, and then I need the polarization vectors, three gamma mu q over root two, uh, and this should be three q, that's my polarization vector. Or actually, should that be a box? Can someone tell me from before? Minus is a box, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, okay. And this just equals what? This just equals, let me erase this Feynman diagram. Uh, this just equals the basic uh, thing. This should just be, I don't know, square root two IB. Let me make sure I get my factors right. One, three. Q over three Q, where here I use the fears identity, which is what we learned last week. So do you want me to remind you of the fears identity? Would that be helpful? Okay, fine. Okay, so what is the fears identity that I used in the last step? So remember, recall from last time, that the fears identity is, is just goes like this. So if I have one gamma mu, two, three gamma mu, four, right? So if I have that combination, which is what I have, right? then I can just write this as two, one, three, two, four. Okay, which is what I did. Okay, so if you want to review this derivation, you can go back in your notes. But this is this is just the fears identity, or one of the fears identities for spinner helicity, which you saw a lot of them for QED, right? Johnson went through them, so they're they're kind of important in this formalism. Okay, but we have we have several problems. Can someone tell me what the problems are with this expression? We have a few problems with this expression. There are like several issues with this now. The first problem is this is in terms of angles and squares. All right, so this is automatically no good. Remember, we said every amplitude has to be either made up of angles or squares. That just came naturally. 
out of our choice of basis. The second problem, and we'll get rid of them. Second problem is we have this weird Q. Since the polarization vector has some internal momenta of its own, it has some weird label Q. We have to get rid of that, right? It, because of gauge invariance and because of the way we're structuring these things, this amplitude can be dependent on Q. Q is some arbitrary reference momenta, right? Right. So uh, we have to get rid of them, which we can kind of easily. So uh, the first thing I'll do is I'm going to rewrite this guy. So A3 of F minus F bar plus gamma minus. Uh, I'm going to now write as some E tilde, one, three, Q over three Q. And this is just conventions that people use where E tilde is root two of E. Okay. Just pretend I multiplied the I out, okay? But I did, because I took the I out from the left, okay? Is that okay? Why I got rid of the eye? I just smell, okay. I don't want you to think eyes are just disappearing. They're not. Okay, so uh, obviously this needs to be independent of Q. I, I, I hope that's somewhat clear to you. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna multiply by one equals one, two over one, two. I can always just multiply by one, right? And we know this guy's one. <laughs> so that usually that's sometimes a nice technique if we want to get rid of some stuff at the cost of uh, picking up some stuff. But you know, it shouldn't be so bad. So my amplitude is now just E tilde one three two Q over three Q times one two over one two. But what we know, what's very good about what I just did here is now I can use one of our famous identities. Right? And we know that this guy is just going to become minus one, two, Q. The amplitude. I don't know why I have two equal signs. Oh, sorry, this should be a box. Okay. Does anyone want to see the identity I used to get from here to here? Would that be helpful to anyone or no? Yes, okay, I can show it. So remember uh, uh, in last lecture, we had some P tau K, right? We had some object that looked like that for light like vectors. Sorry, this should be P tau K angle, sorry, right? Right, so this, remember we derived that this is just minus tau tau k. Remember, we got this expression from last time. I came up with some other light like vector. And so what I just wrote here is now we can write down one, two, uh, two q as minus one, two, q. Is that okay? That's all I'm doing with that term. You'll see why. Okay, very good. Right. So 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 now I have this term that that I got by taking away the one two and the two q, uh, and so now I'm left with one three, all over three q. One, two. Okay. So now I'm going to erase this little guy. What I would do, guys, because you're going to be doing these kinds of calculations, make a little notebook or have a little sheet of paper where you put all these identities down. Right? That's so useful because then you just refer to it. I used to have that. Remember, we learned all the trace uh, rules for the gamma matrices. I always used to have a little sheet with me with the rules. I actually probably still have the sheet of paper because every time I would do a calculation, I just pull it out and use it. 
right? Because who's going to memorize all of that? So there's no point. Just just write them down and, you know. Okay, very good. So now the second step is we want to imply impose momentum conservation. So momentum conservation demands. So momentum conservation demands that P2 equals minus P1 minus P3. That's just uh, the rule for momentum conservation. And so now using momentum conservation, we can write down one, two, two, Q in the following way. We can write it as minus one, two, two, Q. equals one, let me just work out the signs in my head. Yeah, one plus P3, two. Sorry, Q, Q, okay. And so I can just write that one, three Q, just using the same argument, is just equal to one, three, three Q. Sort of working backwards a little bit. Okay. Okay. Is that okay? Or are we confused a lot? Being a little confused is okay. Being a lot confused is not okay. Okay. Okay, so I think we're done. We've simplified, we have enough. Let me just check. Let me make sure we get this into a nice, uh... wait, I think I might have, oh no, I'm good. Wait, one, three, Q. Right, right. So now, now I can get a nice simplified expression for the amplitude. Just, you know, plugging this all in. Okay, so let's just write down the simple expression for the amplitude. So now A3 of F plus F bar, sorry, F minus F bar plus gamma minus is just one, three, squared over one, two, e tilde. Yeah. Okay. So I just, if you want to work that out, that's a good check, verify, plug it in, work out the algebra, but I did it in my head. I think it works well. Okay, so is this amplitude clean? Yes, only angles, right? And we got rid of that nifty, you know, that Q. That Q really can't mean anything. It's just a, re re a reference spinner. It's just arbitrary. These momentas are real momentas. Not real as in real numbers, but they're, their momentous we need to deal with. Okay, okay, good. Okay, let me just write down some more conservation stuff. So P1 mu plus P2 mu plus P3 mu just by conservation of momentum must equal zero, right? And I can write down some nice identities with conservation of momenta, which is stuff we've used. So one, two, 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 one, this uh, angle bracket thing, 
as we saw last week, becomes 2p1 dot p2, right? Something we saw last week. And by virtue of these arguments, this is just p1 squared plus p2 squared equals p3 squared equals zero, right? So what we have decided now and what we've figured out is either one, two or one, two box must vanish. Right, that's what we've uh, concluded from this discussion. Okay, so are we okay with this now? Okay, I think the next, next example will be better because we're gonna do your favorite cross uh, scattering amplitude of all time. All right, Jenna, Compton scattering, isn't that your favorite of all time? <laughs> okay, let's do Compton scattering in spinner helicity. Okay, that will be a good sort of cap to this because we want to compute some classic QED amplitudes as well, not just these simple sort of trivial cases almost. Okay, let's do Compton scattering. So again, Compton scattering is just E minus gamma to E minus gamma, right? That's the basic schematic of Compton scattering. And at tree level, I can have two diagrams. So I can have A4, F, uh, wait a second. Right, 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 right. F bar, F gamma, gamma. Remember, I am imposing that everything is outgoing. That's why I had to stop there, right? That's why one of these will be an antiparticle, right? Because you, you can't have two going regular particles. You need to have another out. And I can always get the other amplitude by using crossing symmetry, right? Just by switching the signs, okay? I just want to make that clear because you'll be like, why is that F bar coming out? Right, so I'll attach the I. So I A4, F bar F gamma gamma. We'll draw the Feynman diagrams. Just one, two, some internal line, and photons coming out. Okay. We'll call this three, we'll call this four, and the second tree level diagram is one, two, right? And except now, just with crossing symmetry, we'll call this four, and we'll call this three. Okay, is that okay? That's at tree level. And yes, it's that trivial. You switch the label, <laughs> that's what you do. Okay, let's just write down the amplitude. So we get IE squared. That comes from the two vertices, right? We're gonna get some gamma matrices as well. So I'll have U bar two. I'm gonna just suppress the dependencies, right? PQ, you know what they are. Epsilon four. Minus I, P1 plus P3 slash, right? That's the fermion propagator over P1 plus P3 squared. This is just the fermion propagator that we're so used to. And epsilon three slash V1, and then plus the second diagram, we go three, four. Okay, that's my amplitude in normal field theory language, right? I'm just suppressing the dependencies on P and Q so I don't have to write out everything but you know what they are. So note that we have an odd number of gamma matrices, right? I haven't specified the helicity yet, right? We have an odd number, let me make sure we do actually. Yes, one, two, three, right? From the slashes, each slash. We have an odd number of them. 
That means that the particles are going to have to have opposite velocity because one can check that this guy is zero. Okay, so if, if we don't have a uh, opposite velocity, wait a second, should this have a box or an angle? This might need an, actually, I think this is an angle, sorry. Okay, one can check that this guy is zero, which makes sense, right? Because the trace of an odd number of gamma matrices is always zero, and you should, you should verify this. Okay, so let's have, both photons. Okay, let's have let, 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 let's do this helicity then. Let's have a four i. Four just means n equals four. So I have f f bar gamma gamma. How do I want to split up the helicities now? Uh, let's do let's think this bar. Let's do plus minus plus minus. Okay, that's my helicities that now I want to impose on this. And now we have to write this in spinner helicity. So maybe you take a minute and write that, write down what you think. It's 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 long. It's not a <laughs> it's not an easy expression at all because you have all these gamma matrices everywhere. Okay, I'm gonna write down what I calculated on paper, it's really long, but you should verify it, the expression. Okay, so let's write this down. So you get two e squared, two four q four minus one one minus three three two three one all over one three one three two three three two four four Whew. now I have to write down the second diagram which I'm going to do so this is all plus right and now I'm just going to switch the threes and the fours okay so it's kind of kind of trivial, but we, we need the second diagram. So 2e squared, 2q3, 3, minus 1, 1, minus 4, 4, 4, q4. Oh no, q4, 1. All over one four one four two three three two four four. Oh my gosh, okay. Yeah, I know. You have to sit and work it out because there's many different parts in there. Just expand each object, you'll get the right answer. It's sort of like in your problem set when you were writing out the Christophels. That, yeah, okay, good. It's the same kind of thing. It's not really uh By the way, tomorrow is the last day for this GR problem set. So I would like it basically done because I wanna assign you amplitude problems now. So, you know, we can discuss it tomorrow. Okay, so whatever, whatever. Let's just, let just, you just, you know, give me your blind faith because you haven't verified this yet. You're, you'll go home and verify it. 
let's just work with this now, okay? Right, so let's just say we got to this stage. This is kind of annoying. That's why I have it on paper because if I, I don't have time to work at the algebra today, I can do it tomorrow. But let's just, let just work out, let's just work with this now, okay? And see how spinner helicity is so powerful. This looks like a total mess. I don't even really know what to do with this. So let's, let's start, let's start massaging this. So first of all, let's use conservation of momentum. Let's let Q3 equal Q4 equal P1. Okay. Right. And if you if you do that, then this whole second term just vanishes. Because I have two Q3, Q4, one. That combination is going to be zero just by this condition. Okay, so immediately conservation of momentum, I get rid of the second term. This whole long nasty business. Let me make sure I don't have anything like that in my first term, right? No, I'm good. I, I'm being very nasty, very, very, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. This is Q subscript four. This is Q subscript three, okay? That's not Q four in the top, just make sure. That's Q subscript four, okay? Okay, so let me rewrite this now. So now what do I get for the amplitude? So the amplitude now, And you can multiply this guy out, right, by these guys, okay? And you'll find that the amplitude now is just e tilde minus e tilde squared, two, four, one, three, e one, three, one, over one, three, one, three, one, three, one, four. Okay, hold on, I'll be right back. Just Okay, this you'll get after working all of this stuff out, okay? You multiply and whatever. You can start doing it on your paper, it works. You'll find that all the cues are. All the cues are done, done with. Well. Okay, now I'm working with something far simpler. And now, Let's just see what can cancel. So this disappears. Let me make sure I, I, I'm doing this correctly. Right, 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 right. Mm. This disappears. Right, good. So I'm left with minus e tilde squared, two, four, three, one, over one, three, one, four. Okay, that's what I'm left with. Two, four, one, three, one, three, one, four. Yeah, the numbers can be moved around, it's not matter. We're almost there, we have to do one more thing to this. So, right, so now I'm at minus e tilde squared, two, four, three, one, over one, three, one, four. Almost there. What can we, what can we do to, get, to, to, to figure this out now? Can we do something good or? Are we stuck with uh, stuck with this?
Okay, I can, I mean, I don't have any tricks to use. The one trick I'll use again is momentum conservation. Okay, to write down two, three, one, three, is equal to minus two, four, one, four. Okay. That's my momentum, my final momentum conservation trick. <laughs> I just love the way these things work. They're so interesting. Which again, allows me to finally write down my final expression plus f minus gamma plus gamma minus as e tilde squared to the squared over one three. Let me make sure I did that all right. Because sometimes I make errors on this. Two, four, one, three, one, three, one, four. Momentum conservation means that the top guy now becomes uh, minus two, four, Okay, two, three, one, three. Right, good, good, good. I don't know why I gave you this example. Just write it down with these numbers, okay? I mean, I don't know why I use these numbers here. Let me just do it with these numbers, the way we wrote it down. Basically what you're trying to do is trying to get these guys in a way so you can cancel out the box, right? And you're always gonna be left with one of the brackets square because you're just adding another bracket term. So trying, you know, this is not for this. <laughs> Sorry, I just wrote down a random one. You can write down one to cancel out the boxes. Okay, but anyways, this is the, I, I trust, I trust you can get here. If you can't, we'll work it out tomorrow. Okay, very good. Is everyone somewhat okay with this or are we having a lot of trouble seeing this stuff? Okay, okay. You're gonna have to do the calculations on your own, right? You can, just seeing it on the board is not enough. Okay, I'm gonna start the basics of Yang Mills today, but I'm not gonna go too in depth. Uh, so, oh, right, your homework. So before, let me write down your homework then. Uh, yeah, right. So your homework uh, is just going to be scattering amplitudes, right? The archive, on archive. If you can't find it, let me know. I'll continue chapters two and three because they're long, right? So you, you'll have a few weeks. Okay. It's on archive. If you need it, let me know. This is from last week. Also, if you haven't gotten a chance to read about Yang Mills theory, please do it because now it's going to get heavy with the Yang Mills theory. And I'm not, I'm going to cover it, but not really. Okay. Okay. So this is all fine and dandy, but you might be saying, okay, you know, this isn't really a big deal. Who cares? Right. Because in QED, I can, you know, I have some trouble doing Compton scattering or Baba scattering or whatever. But I can get through it, right? I can use the trace rules, do the sum over spins. We've done that exercise many, many times. And I can get some nice coherent cross section. Well, we've already discussed for gluons and QCD, this is just impossible, all right? You, you have to like go through 24 pages of algebra. So we're gonna find that we can completely generalize all tree level gluon amplitudes in one expression. That's what's so powerful about this technique. And some of you may, if you've explored the double copy, may have seen a similar expression, okay? So let's just begin with the Yang Mills Lagrangian. The Yang Mills Lagrangian is minus a quarter, trace F mu nu, F mu nu. All right, I hope that looks familiar to you from Yang Mills theory. Okay, where F mu nu now, the field strength tensor, is defined a little differently in Yang-Mills theory. It's d mu a nu minus d mu a nu. Uh, minus ig over root two, the commutator of the gauge fields. And in, for those of you that are really into differential forms, you can also write f as the exterior derivative of a plus a wedge A. Okay. 
that's another way people see this thing. This might look crazy to you. You can look it up. I just wanted to show you because sometimes people write it geometrically. Okay. Okay, very good. So this is just the basic Yang Mills Lagrangian. I hope this looks somewhat familiar to you. I'm not gonna really, I'm gonna do one really basic example today for gluons because I don't have a lot of time. Otherwise we would have gone through all of this. Okay, A mu is the gauge field, right? But in Yang Mills theory, it's defined as A mu A T A. So it gets a color index and a generator. And we'll go through this more in depth in a few, few weeks, but I want you to read about it so you can at least understand this basic stuff. Okay, the gauge group for Yang Mills theory, we'll call it G, is just SU3, right? And for N number of gluons, it's just SUN. Okay. Where we have the normalization that the trace of the generators, some TATB, is just delta AB. And we can write down the algebra of the theory in a very nice way. So the commutator of the generators that generate all of the uh, pr uh, items in our uh, group is just I F tilde ABC TC, where these are the structure, the called so-called structure constants. When you read about this thing. So that's Yang Mills theory. These A's and B's are color factors, right? Because quarks can have different colors. And now that's another degree of freedom we have to worry about. That's what makes this a little bit more complicated. Okay, unfortunately, we cannot get any Feynman rules from the top Lagrangian. As you may have seen, we need to gauge fix it first. Okay. So there are many different gauges people can pick, but for scattering amplitudes, we choose a very particular gauge. Okay, called the Nervous Juevo gauge. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it. Let me actually first tell you what the gauge does before I write down the Lagrangian. Okay, so the gauge fixed term in the Lagrangian now. Okay, so now I'm just going to give you the gauge fixed term is just minus one half trace H mu nu squared, I'll tell you what H is, where H mu nu, um, these are, this is just the extra, extra stuff, is D mu A mu minus IG over root two A mu A mu. Okay, that's the gauge fixture. Okay, and now let me write down the gauge fixed Lagrangian, the full gauge fixed Lagrangian for you. So L is now the trace of minus one half D mu A mu D mu A mu. Minus I. 2g. I'm just trying to work out the terms. D mu, a mu, a mu, a mu, right? This is just coming from this gauge fixed term. Plus g squared over 4, a mu, a mu, a mu, a mu. Okay, that's the full gauge fixed Lagrange. Okay, and this gives you the Feynman rules and the famous gluon propagator, which is delta AB, eta over P squared. Sorry, eta should obviously have a new name. That's the gluon propagator, which you can see derived in many places. Okay, and these all involve these sort of structure constants or what we call color, color factors or kinematic factors, right? Uh, so like F tilde ABC. Right? And even things like 
f tilde a b x f tilde x c b so like combinations so maybe if you have four, four gluons you'd have a combination right if you had three gluons you'd have one color factor okay and these guys form something called a jacobi identity which i'm not going to write down today we'll write down next week because i'm out of time but I'll leave this on the board so I remind myself to form a Jacobi identity. Which definitely someone like Jenna has seen in, in basic explorations. Okay, very good. Okay, so what did we do today? We did QED for spinner helicity. My suggestion to you is to go online and work through it very slowly. These are these are good calculations to do. Second thing, we began just, I didn't even discuss spinner helicity of Yang Mills, but what I've articulated to you is that this formalism is extremely powerful in the context of non abelian gauge theories. Okay, very, very powerful. And we're gonna see that next week in full display. After we do that, here are the topics. So we're gonna be done with this scattering amplitude stuff for a little bit after next week. I just wanna do Yang Mills theory. And next week, Yang Mills theory won't take me long because you're going to see it's kind of simple at tree level because I'm not going to do loop level. It's pretty simple. So it should take us about 40 minutes. And then we'll begin conformal field theory. So if you want to read ahead, that's what you should read about. Uh, just get the basic understanding. And after that, we're going to probably do a little bit of uh, string amplitudes, give you the basics of what string theory. I'm not going to do a full deep dive into string theory. I, I'm not, I don't feel like doing that because that, that's a whole year on its own. But, but I'll give you the basics so you kind of know the language a little bit. You don't have to be an expert, but you can do a little calculation here and there, okay? Because it's, it's very challenging in my opinion. It's, it's, it's too much. Okay, okay, very good. Uh, not that this is not challenging. This is very challenging too. It's just that there's a little bit more mathematics you'll need to know to really be able to do it. And so, okay, tomorrow we'll meet in the morning. We'll discuss your GR problems. I took a look, I think I took a look about four or five days ago. I saw a little bit there. I'll take a look again. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll meet tomorrow and then we'll finish cosmology. Any questions for me? Okay, my suggestion, really sit through, really work through the steps, okay? like really do it. And tomorrow also Johnson will be giving his talk after on group theory, which is a very nice introduction to groups from score one, okay? Because we throw around a lot of jargon in this course. Uh, so it's good to get a feel for it. Okay, let me stop recording.